Hey there, interwebs, and welcome to a special Christmas episode of How Fascinating. In the spirit of the holiday, I'd like to briefly discuss one of Christian mythology's most misunderstood members. Picture, if you will, Old Nick. Does he look like the man on screen? You're probably expecting me to say this isn't what Santa traditionally looked like, but you'd be falling prey to my Kansas City shuffle, because you've got entirely the wrong Old Nick. One of Santa's pseudonyms is Old Saint Nick. Old Nick is another slightly obsolete name for the big man himself, Satan. Where do you get this nickname? Pun obviously intended? Well, one theory goes that Old Nick comes from Nikor, another name for Nex, Nixa, Nixies, or Nokin, which are Germanic water spirits. We've covered them in the mermaid video, and I'll get to why the King of Hell is being associated with strange women lying in ponds in a little bit. Another theory says Old Nick comes from Old Iniquity, a title bestowed upon the devil in medieval morality plays. Yet a third theory actually connects Satan directly to Santa, or rather his forerunner, St. Nicholas of Myra. The short version of that theory is that the Puritans weren't fond of all this fun and festivity intruding upon their holiday, or anywhere else in their lives for that matter, because, you know, Puritans, and likened Christmas's frontman to the devil himself. The reason we have so many theories is that nobody quite knows where Old Nick comes from. The Puritans are also why another name for Santa is Kris Kringle, although that comes to us by way of the Pennsylvania Dutch and is a product of the fact that most Americans don't speak German. That's also why we use the name Pennsylvania Dutch instead of the demonymically correct term Pennsylvania Deutsch. Essentially, the Puritans wanted to keep the Christ in Christmas and oust St. Nick, so they claimed the gift bringer was Jesus, bringing the gift of salvation and a ticket for free admission into heaven. Because the holiday celebrates his birth, they used the term Christkindl, German for Christ child, which got corrupted to Kinkel and then anglicized to Chris Kringle. Quick aside, Christ means anointed one, as in blessed with oil, so his name was essentially Jesus the Oily, and there's gotta be a baby oil pun somewhere in Christ Child. The idea of Greasy Jeezy bringing gifts didn't really stick around, but this Chris Kringle fellow did, and it got retroactively attached to Saint Nick, whom it was meant to supplant. The idea of the gift of salvation was doomed from the start, though. Just think about it for a moment. Christmas is an annual gift-giving holiday, but those golden tickets to heaven are good for a lifetime. I go through socks faster than that, and everyone complains about getting those. This makes Jesus that guy who shows up at your house with the same gift he got you last year, every year, and it's the sort of thing you only need one of, and you can't even regift it the next year because it's got your name on it. I mean, Jesus Christ, this wasn't thought out at all, was it? Another kenning for the diabolical dude is Old Scratch. This comes from the Middle English Scrat, a kind of goblin or demon, which comes in turn from the Old Norse Skrata. I find it humorously serendipitous that Scratch and Nick are both euphemisms for small cuts, and both can also be euphemisms for the devil when prefaced by old. Getting back to Saint Nick, he's one of the sources where we get the idea of gift-giving around Christmas. The historical figure was allegedly in the habit of secretly distributing gifts to children. In the Germanic parts of Europe, they celebrate Saint Nicolaus Day on December 5th, and in the Netherlands, they have a character with a big white beard, crozier, and red bishop's outfit named Sinterklaas, which is where we get the name Santa Claus. Children sing songs for him and leave their boots out that night filled with hay or a carrot for his horse. After his trusty steed has emptied the shoes, Sinterklaas refills them with candy and small toys. Believe it or not, we used to practice this tradition in my house when I was but a wee skelf. I still fondly remember getting a pack of dinosaur cards one year. Santa may be a lazy anagram of Satan, but the similarities don't end there. Modern iconography depicts both of them conspicuously clad in red, but that wasn't always the case. Another one of Santa's predecessors was Father Christmas, who represents feasting, drinking, revelry, and seasonal good cheer, and is traditionally sporting a pagan holly wreath on his head and dressed in green. The devil wasn't always red, either. In this 15th century painting by Michael Pacher, the devil appears in green, and poets from around that time, such as Geoffrey Chaucer, drew connections between the devil and the color green. In Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the titular colorful character is quite an enigma who's still a subject of some debate to this day. One interpretation is that he's in league with the devil, or perhaps even the big guy himself. Another, more accepted view is that he's some sort of fey entity, because green equals nature and shit. C.S. Lewis described him as being, quote, as jolly as a Dickensian Christmas host, unquote, clearly referring to Father Christmas. This ghost of Christmas present and fey spirit night are both clad in greenery for more or less the same reason, to represent nature, and the devil is green because Christianity really doesn't truck with pagans. At least, not once they're done stealing all their holidays and iconography off them. If you don't believe me, look at the Christmas wreath. Christianity's canon explanation is that they're made from evergreen to represent everlasting life through Jesus, and their circles to evoke a halo and because a circle has no beginning or end, like Yahweh. Just ignore the fact that wreaths were being used by pagans 500 years before Christ arrived on the scene. In the words of my witch of a girlfriend, Of course, I'm not suggesting that Santa and the devil are the same person just because they have matching outfits. But I can give you a concrete connection if you really want. But first, Latin. There's a Latin saying attributed to Plutarch, Barba non facit philosophum, a beard does not make a philosopher. 
I prefer the variant I made up, Barba non facit Barbara. A beard does not make a barbarian. One, it's a pun, and two, the three professions most associated with beards are lumberjacks, barbarians, and wizards. The first two also both use axes and hang out in the woods, and you know you're manly when even your axe has a beard. The third one is regarded as being very wise, and also hangs out in the woods. There is another Latin phrase, Barba tenus sapientes. He is as wise as far as his beard, that is to say, not very wise at all and only having the appearance of a wise man. Ironically, most wizards are wise and have beards, and the older and wiser a wizard grows, the longer his beard generally grows as well. This is because, by my guesstimation, 75-90% to 90% of all wizards created in the past century are based on some combination of Merlin and Gandalf. Merlin himself was a fictional character, but based on a composite of two pseudo-historical figures, a Romano-British war leader named Ambrosius Aurelianus, and a Welsh bardic prophet named... That... Okay, uh, Myrthen and Wicht. Gandalf was also inspired by a few sources, including this postcard, but his most influential and famous forefather was the Allfather himself, motherfucking Odin. Both follow the old grey wanderer format, carry a staff, practice magic, and are known to engage in trickery from time to time. Just look at how Bilbo got roped into an adventure in The Hobbit. As a matter of fact, my own father has earned the nickname Gandalf among Boy Scouts for his tendency to slyly wrangle Scouts into adventures of their own. This is the Elder Futhark rune Ansus, which means God and represents an A vowel sound. It later split into three different vowel sounds in Anglo-Saxon, each with their own attached symbolism, but the one which continued to represent God looked like this. The Norse pantheon was, well, a pantheon of many gods, but M.F. Odin was God-in-chief, so this was kind to his rune and refers to the old one-eyed bastard specifically in the Icelandic rune poem. Gandalf also used a rune as his sigil, for lack of a better word, and his was the Kurth rune for G, which looked like this. I don't have any proof that one inspired the other, but given that Tolkien was a linguist and professor of Anglo-Saxon first and an author second, it's not a huge leap to assume such was the case. Oh, and regarding the wisdom as far as his beard goes, Odin is the Norse god of war and wisdom, among other things, and carries the epithet Langbarder, literally long beard. I bring all this up because Gandalf isn't the only character taking inspiration from old Wisebeard. You guessed it, so is Santa. Odin's ride is not eight tiny reindeer, but rather an eight-legged horse named Sleipnir, to whom Loki gave birth. Prior to Clement Clark Moore's classic poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, giving him a team of reindeer, St. Nicholas traditionally got around by horse, as Sinterklaas continues to do to this day, since traditions tend to hang around even if their origins don't. However, the poem's eponymous character is St. Nick in name only, and is much more like an elf himself. As a matter of fact, the narrator calls him a jolly old elf. His sleigh is specifically said to be miniature, he and his reindeer are described as tiny or little half a dozen times, and how big can a person really be and still fit down a chimney? Speaking of, there's a claim that the idea of Santa and his flying reindeer was inspired by psychedelic mushrooms known as fly agaric, which Siberian shamans would consume to induce spiritual trances, mixing mythology and mycology. They'd travel with reindeer, who'd eat the mushrooms as well. These animal companions would get high and jump around because they're slightly out of their gourds, and the shamans would think they're flying because the shamans are out of their gourds too. The mushrooms are those red ones with white spots, so the shamans wore corresponding red robes with white trim. Sound familiar? Well, it's a complete coincidence. There's actually a lot of debate in the ethnomycological community about whether or not magic mushrooms have anything to do with the modern image of Santa, but there's no direct connection we know of. See the link in the description and draw your own conclusions. Santa is totally an elf, though, and not in the good Tolkien elf kind of way or the cookie elf kind of way, more of the don't-mess-with-the-fair-folk kind of way. Devotion to Yahweh may pay off somewhere down the line in some non-specific way, indistinguishable from hard work, but a deal with the devil always yields immediate measurable results. At the same time, if a Christian child is well-behaved and obeys a certain code, a creature who's basically a fey entity will break into their home shortly after the solstice and leave them a reward. You don't want to know what happens to the naughty children who break contracts. Speaking of, what's the deal with the Tooth Fairy? I mean that quite literally. What is it, if not a pact, motivated by avarice, with a fey entity wherein children exchange part of their corporeal being for minor monetary gain? Why are we teaching children to do this? Do we want fey pact warlocks? Because that's how you get fey pact warlocks. Take off your paper crowns and put on your foil hats now, because shit's about to get crazy. One of Santa's progenitors was Odin, whom the Romans associated with Mercury, but the reason is less than clear. Maybe it's because they're both psychopomps, tricksters, and travelers in search of knowledge. Maybe it's because they each had a cool staff. We'll likely never know. Regardless, Mercury was the Roman version of the Hellenistic Greek deity Hermes, messenger of the gods and god of tricksters, liars, liars, and a bunch of other things, too. In Mycenaean Greece, or maybe even earlier, Hermes and Pan were the same person, only to split apart in later mythology. The Romans conflated the latter with the Greek satyrs to create fauns, and much later, Christians looked at the three and said, Yup, there's our devil. 
You see, Christianity had this habit of taking the gods and related characters from other established pagan and heathen religions and literally demonizing them to stir up converts due to that whole first commandment thing. For example, the devil has a pitchfork because the Roman god Neptune, aka Poseidon, has a trident. Pan is the reason why devils are so often shown with horns and optionally goat legs. The pagan Danes saw Jesus like this, but their Christian contemporaries probably viewed Odin less favorably, seeing him as a heathen devil. Basically, Santa was inspired by Odin, associated with Mercury slash Hermes, who used to be Pan, who gave his iconic look to Satan. This means that Santa is indeed related to Satan by anywhere from three to five different religions. O. M. Literal G. So yeah, Santa and Satan may be more correlated than we first assumed. Am I saying they're one and the same? No, of course not. Not at all. A little. The thing is, nothing evolves in a vacuum, and religion is no exception. Much of modern Christian tradition was borrowed, stolen, or evolved from earlier pagan practices, which Christianity later went out of its way to demonize. Frankly, it'd be a Christmas miracle if jolly old Saint Nick didn't end up linked with the devil. As for me, I'm going back to my Plutonian cult. We have a three-headed doggo and delicious fruit. What's that? Kerberos had anywhere from one to a hundred heads, and Plutos and Pluton were separate deities distinct from Hades? God damn it, I'm gonna have to make another video now, aren't I? Well, anyway, thanks for watching this special Christmas episode, and of course, Happy Hanukkah! I gotta go see about some Chinese food in a movie.